about the liturgical seasons in my time with children. Do you remember when we were talking about how there are different seasons of the church and we know that because of the colors, right? Isabel, Noah, Sophie, do you remember that? We changed our color. It's not green anymore because last Sunday was the last Sunday in our year. And this Sunday is the first Sunday in Advent. So it is the first Sunday. It's our new year in the Christian church, in our Christian church anyway. So we're celebrating a new year. And how do we know that? Because of our colors, right? Our colors are for royalty. And I pulled out my purple sweater just so I would match the Sunday. But I said I can't do it every Sunday. <laughs> so. Happy, uh, you could. <laughs> Maybe you have to loan me some, Phil. So, Happy New Year to the church. Can we all say Happy New Year? Happy New Year. Good job. Good job. Okay, so there isn't an actual time with children today, um, but there's a lot of interaction in what we're doing because we begin our worship series called Worship in the Waiting. The Waiting the clock theme, we're all waiting. This beautiful thing was created by uh, Mike Carpenter and decorated by his lovely wife, um, Crystal. And Irma and Crystal and Mike and Mike Tory uh, were here and s we set everything up on uh, Friday of this week. So <laughs> it's fun and Mike, Carpenter never wants to work on lights again. <laughs> so let us begin by offering one another the sign of peace. Oh, wait though. Linda is home ill today. So we'll all pray that she has a quick recovery. So we don't have a prelude and a postlude. Um, Sharon, I'm bouncing a little bit. I don't know why. There you go. No, still a little feedback. Shall we all stand and uh, wish one another... Um, the sign of peace, wish, not wish, offer. Okay, peace be with you all. Very good. Okay, you may be seated. And it's me, right? So I've given most of the greeting, I think. Um, I just want to say that I am Reverend Brenda Torrey, and we are at First United Methodist Church in Newcastle. And I think that I've given you all the good news about the season that we are turning, and we'll have four weeks of Advent and then Christmas Eve. So I hope that everyone really enjoys the Worship in the Waiting series. It's going to be interactive and participatory, and uh, we light the first candle today, which is... Yell it out. Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a little, oh. yeah, there's a, there, there's a little helper. <laughs> so we light the first candle of hope today. And no, just will not come up. Okay. Okay. All right. You're on then, Mike. Well then, with that, I'll invite you to stand as you are able and join me in this morning's call to worship. Let us pray that we may be vigilant to see the coming of our Lord among us. Our saving God, long ago you sent your Son Jesus among us, but we have been little aware of his presence, and we hide him even from others. Wake us up, make us recognize him, that he may be the light of our lives, and that eagerly we may lead people to him. May he build up among us and make us a world and a kingdom of peace and love where we serve you in one another as we move forward in hope to your home of endless joy and rest. 
We ask this through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to come forward to light the first Advent candle of. Oh. <laughs> Way to go, D. <laughs> if ever there was a year we needed Advent, this is the year. We hardly know how to describe the year we have lived through. We hesitate to reflect on all the mess around us in 2020. All we know is that nothing seems right. Nothing seems like it used to be. Nothing. We need Advent. We light this first candle as a sign of our hope. Hope that you can meet us even in the mess of our world. Hope that you still see us, though we feel we are lost in the rubble. Let this light be the guide that brings us to Emmanuel once more. All. O oh, come, O oh, oh, come, come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Thy people free 
This is a dramatized poem called Intention. I'm left. I'm right. I'm for duties. I'm for rights. I'm for love. I'm for reason. I'm for boundaries. I'm for freedom. But when we hold these things in tension, we find it's bouncy, like suspension. There's energy, like trampolines, and power with intention. When these things, they pull and flow, it's like an arrow in a bow. It's like the skin across a drum. In our diversity, we can be one. Number one says, I'm shy in church. <laughs> Number two says, I'm really loud. <laughs> I'm nervous here. I'm cool and proud. I like the prayers. I love to sing. I must be still. I must do things. But when we hold these things in tension, we find it's bouncy, like suspension. There's energy, like trampolines, and power with intention. When these things, they pull and flow, it's like an arrow in a bow. It's like the skin across a drum. In our diversity, we can be one. And number one says, God is holy. And number two says, God is near. Love is awesome. Love casts out fear. The Bible's hard. The Bible's clear. Jesus is coming. Jesus is here. But when we hold these things in tension, we find it's bouncy like suspension. There's energy like trampolines and power with intention. These things, they pull and flow and it's like an arrow in a bow. It's like the skin across a drum. In our diversity, we can be one.
Amen. Today's psalm reading is an adaptation of Psalm 25, verses 1 to 10. Psalm 25. I lift up my soul to you, O Lord. My God, I trust in you. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies win. No one who puts on you will be put to shame, but those who hurt others without a reason will be ashamed. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and guide me, for you are the God who saves me. I wait for you all day long. Remember your compassion and loving kindness, O Lord for they are from old. Do not remember the sins from my youth or my rebellious ways. By your loving kindness, remember me, for you are, God, are good, O Lord. Good and right is the Lord. So he teaches those who stumble off the path. He leads the humble into what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who follow his directions. Our next reading, as promised, is participatory. So I'm going to do an adapted reading and you're going to participate. You get to sit, so you get to relax. So as we're doing this, consider a fig tree and it is the fig tree reading. Look up, said Jesus. Everybody look up. And you will see signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. Listen up, said Jesus. And you will hear the roaring of the sea and the crashing of the waves and the distress of people on earth, confused by what is happening. Look around, said Jesus. And you will see people fainting and trembling with fear at all that is coming upon the world and at the shaking of the powers of the heavens. Now straighten up, said Jesus, and lift up your heads. For when all these things begin to happen, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, coming in power, coming in glory, and you will know that your redemption too is coming close. Then Jesus told a parable story. Look at the fig tree. Look at any tree for that matter. When you see the leaves come out, you know that summer is near. In the very same way, when you see the things that I have just described, you will know that the kingdom of God is near. Trust me, this generation will not come to an end until everything that I have described takes place. Heaven and earth may pass away, but not my words, not ever. Now look at yourselves. Watch that you don't get bogged down with bad choices and hard living and drunkenness and all that goes with being carried away with what this world has to offer. For everything that I said will happen, will happen indeed to everyone on earth. And if your attention is fixed on your own pleasure, then it will catch you out 
with a sudden snap like a rat in a trap. But if you stay alert and pay attention and pray, then you will find the strength to escape all that will happen and you will stand at last before the Son of Man. This is the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. Worship in the waiting, our very first sermon, Holy Suspense. So who likes to be on the edge of their seat while they're watching a film? You do, Isabel? My little granddaughter did that. She watched Nightmare, night, what was it, Nightmare Before Christmas? She is not sleeping well. <laughs> Tension is a powerful force, isn't it? It moves stories forward, making us want to keep turning the pages of a book, for those of us that love to read, or keeping our eyes glued to a film or a movie in suspense. Tension is also powerful in creating physical movement. Think about, as we said, a bow and arrow. It is no use having a loose, relaxed bowstring. You need the tension to make the arrow fly. Or think about the strings of a guitar or the skin on a drum. You have to pull at both ends to create the resonant sound. But the problem is, of course, often tensions are uncomfortable. If we know two people are having an argument with differing points of view, we will say that we can feel the tension in the room, right? Tension asks us to hold in balance two things which seem to be opposing each other, and that can be a challenge. This is often true when we try and wrestle with some of the big questions of the Christian faith. Is our God friend, or is he our judge? Is God close to us, or holy and other? Is God in charge, or do we have free will? When questions like this get too much for us, we often give up and collapse the tension, rather than try to wrestle with the apparent contradictions and find creative power in the midst of them. Often, as pastors, we find we are in conflict with the culture around us as we move into what is popularly known as the Christmas season. We often hear that people want only their favorite Christmas carols to sing during this season, that they want nice readings about Jesus, not the ones like we have today. We all want the story of the baby's birth from day one. Okay, when our daughter Michaela was young, she was often sick at home with asthma. And her very favorite show to watch as she was bundled in blankets on the couch sipping her honey sweetened tea was a baby story. Where, much like Mary and Joseph's journey to the stable, we followed parents preparing for the arrival of their little one. And as much as I loved the baby years, I really did, the TV show, show just grew old for me as we watched family after family work through their own set of struggles as they made their way to birthday. We want the Jesus baby story to stay fresh and filled with wonder, building the anticipation. And in the Mark reading, Jesus is imploring us to stay awake that another arrival is on the horizon. As Christians, we hold this tension between preparing for a baby within the next coming weeks and these stories of Jesus' second coming. Two things are happening simultaneously. So here we are today, beginning the season of Advent. And as I've strongly alluded, uh, Advent means coming. The coming of Jesus refers, of course, to his first coming as the baby 2,000 years ago. The birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus kicked off 
kicked off the kingdom of God on earth. Isn't that amazing? This was the beginning of the kingly rule and reign of God, which had been long promised by the prophets. It might have looked very different to what people had expected, but it made a transforming difference in the lives of everyone who responded to it. At the same time, the fullness of Jesus' kingdom won't be complete until he comes again. As well as the first coming of Jesus as a human baby, there is also the second advent, a second coming of Jesus. And this is a clear expectation which the New Testament church had, that Jesus would come again. And Jesus himself speaks of the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Or take, for example, this passage from Hebrews. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And after Jesus' resurrection and his ascension back to his father's side, the angels explained to the disciples, this same Jesus who has taken from you, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This belief in the return of Jesus shapes the whole of the New Testament understanding of what it means to be a Christian and how we are to live in the world as we anticipate Jesus' return. During Advent, we are in a time of anticipation. And our passages for today encourage us to be aware of the time we live in. Paul writes to the Romans, and do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So imagine that you wake up early the day of a great party. It could be your birthday, a wedding or Christmas Day, the night before is almost over, the sun is beginning to come up, you're full of excitement, and yet the party itself has not yet started. In this situation, you begin to live with the anticipation of the day being almost here and frustration that it is not yet fully begun. You would begin to put on your party clothes and do all you could to make final preparations. But you would hold that intention with knowing that the party, in all its fullness, was still a few hours away. This is the time we live in as Christians. The night is almost gone, and the day of Jesus' kingdom has started to dawn. And yet, that kingdom day has not yet arrived in all its fullness. We live with the suspense that the full party has not yet started. Paul tells us to be aware that we are living in this time, this in-between daybreak stage. And this is a great tension in the Christian life, sometimes called the now and not yet of the kingdom. Now, Jesus is king, and at the same time, his kingdom is not yet here, in its fullness. Now, Satan is defeated, and at the same time, we are waiting for all evil to be finally overcome, and so our lives are not yet free from temptation. Now, Jesus has healed the sick and has given us authority to do the same in his name. And at the same time, we live in an era where sick people are not yet healed. Now, Jesus is resurrected from the dead and we are seated with him in the heavenly places. And at the same time, we live in the not yet, where all creation groans to be healed and resurrected. This not now and not yet calls us to a radical form of living. It asks us to be both hope-filled and also realistic. 
Life is not all roses and sunshine this side of Jesus' coming. We all struggle with pain, temptation, disappointment and loss, and especially in this year. The earth continues to groan. The oppressed continue to cry, how long? And yet in the middle of these challenging realities, we have seen the sun beginning to rise and we are called to live in its light. Now there was a third century bishop whose name was Cyprian. And he ran into some uh, real troubles, I'll tell you. Freshly arisen from the waters of baptism, he was made bishop. So I'd like to read a little bit about Cyprian to you as I think his story sheds a little perspective on what we're going through. Are you ready? Cyprian had only recently been baptized when he was elected Bishop of Carthage in 249. That's common era. AD. Empire-wide persecution of Christians began about 250. And Carthage was seriously affected. Shortly after the persecution began, a serious plague broke out in Carthage. Are we feeling for Cyprian at this point? This marked an early point in a pandemic that lasted more than a decade and affected the whole of the Roman Empire. It also was a time of political instability with emperors assassinated and generals replacing them every few months. Rarely was an emperor ruling for years. Blame was placed on the Christians for the plague and Cyprian replied to such charges. This time of plague is called the plague of Cyprian, not because he was considered responsible for it, but because of all the writings of the time that deal with the pandemic, only his sermon treatise on the morality gives an extended description of the effects of the disease on its sufferers. Within the majority pagan population, many relatives of those with the disease evidently abandoned them, leaving them to die outside the house unattended. This had often happened in epidemics, but now the streets were filled with the dead and the dying. It is in such a situation that the Christians displayed a radically different behavior. In his biography of Cyprian, Pontius, a deacon who had served with him, recalls a sermon that the bishop gave calling the people to help their neighbors, caring for the sick and burying the dead, whether they were Christian or not. Cyprian also responds to the question of why the Christians are suffering from this disease as much as the pagans are. He says, Cyprian says, that one does not become a Christian in order to avoid suffering. Christians and non-Christians are all part of one human family and whatever affects one can affect all. He says, we are all good and evil contained in one household. Whatever happens within the house, we suffer with equal fate. But Christians, though they suffer physically as much as others do, may have their faith strengthened by suffering, whereas others who suffer without faith can only complain about their losses. And he writes, that pestilence and plague, which seems horrible and deadly, searches out the righteousness of each one and examines the minds of the human race to see whether they are in health, tend the sick whether relations affectionately love their kindred, whether masters pity their languishing servants, whether when their dear ones perish, the rich even then bestow anything on the poor and give when they are to die without heirs. I think Cyprian has given us a fair idea of how we live through the trials of life. We bear up under them, bringing our best selves, our best ideas, our best ideas about who we are in God's world. 
His call is to put to use the best things God has given us. The poem skit that was played out for us this morning reminds us we can, we can find energy in tension. We go back to Paul as he continues the passage to the Romans. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. And he says, So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. When we know a party is coming, we need to put on our party clothes and prepare all we can for the coming celebration. Similarly, we know Jesus is coming. We know when Jesus is coming. We need to put on our Jesus clothes. For example, the armor of God from Ephesians 6. And attitudes like compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Jesus reminds his disciples that nobody knows the time of his return and that we should be careful of your hearts or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the anxieties of life and the anxieties of life and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. In this passage and in many of his parables, Jesus asks us to live in a holy suspense, ready for his return. Now, Lisa Sharon Harper describes living that way in this way. Evidence of the presence of the kingdom of God is thick, thick wherever and whenever people stand on the promise of God, <coughs> excuse me, that there is more to this world, more to this life than what we see. There is more than the getting over, the getting by, or getting mine. There is more than the brokenness, the destruction, and the despair that threatens to wash over us like the waters of the deep. There is a vision of a world where God cuts through the chaos, where God speaks and there is light. There is a vision where there is protection. Did you all hear that? There is a vision where there is protection and where love is binding every relationship together. Amen? Amen. Let us begin our pastoral lament. How long? We join with the psalmist, their spirit in anguish. How long, Lord, how long? We join with the broken, the beaten, the famished. How long, Lord, how long? We join with those suffering discrimination. We join with the scapegoats in every nation. How long, Lord? How long? We join with the woman whose voice has been silenced. How long, Lord? How long? We join with the girl and the boy who are subject to violence. How long, Lord? How long? We join with the martyrs, their voices as one. How long? 
waiting and longing for justice to come. We join with our Lord as he hangs on the cross. How long, Lord? How long? Bearing our pain as he suffers with us. How long, Lord? How long? We join with the earth as it groans for release. How long, Lord? How long? We long for your kingdom of righteousness and peace. How long? Here's our responsive sending prayer. Sharon, I'll give you a minute. There we go. You begin. What time is it? The hour has come to wake from your slumber. What time is it? The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Time to put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. What time is it? Time to go out clothed in Christ.